All right, let's get going here. Hey, everybody, it's John Barrows with J. Barrows Consulting on Make It Happen Monday. Happy Monday, everybody. Hopefully, you're all having a good day and had a great weekend. Uh, coming here to the home, home stretch here, I uh, I spent uh, last week was a bananas week for me. I was in, uh, let's see, D.C., Atlanta, and Dublin, and then came home. And then this weekend, I was going to do a, kind of a little bit of downtime this weekend, but found out my daughter got into a commercial. So we went up to Burlington, Vermont for the entire weekend to watch her shoot a video. She's seven years old. So it's pretty cool to watch her kind of go through that process. And uh, it was a fun learning experience for me. But anyways, back on track this week. This is my last week of absolute bananas. And then I'm shutting it down as of Friday because I need some mental break here before I go absolutely crazy. Um, <clears throat> and also before sales kickoff st uh, season starts because I um, that's my busiest time of the season. So a lot of what's happening this week. I, I have two training sessions this week, but I also have um, uh, some planning sessions with my team. So Morgan, uh, my CEO, Megan, and then this kid, Lucas, who's helping me out with planning and doing a lot of the social stuff. We're all getting together on Thursday and Friday and really going over what the year looked like, like what we did good and what we did bad this year, what we could improve on, and then setting some plans and some very specific goals for next year. And I'm going to talk about that later after I hit on this topic today of referrals. But, you know, one of the most important things I think everybody can do right now with all the insanity that's going on is force some time to reflect on what happened last year and also think about planning what next year looks like. So you're not just stuck going through the motions, right? Because you get on that hamster wheel, it's hard to get off. If you're not setting goals, then somebody else is dictating the path and, and you're just along for the ride. If you're setting goals, then you have a chance at, at dictating where you go. So for instance, take your quota next year forever, whatever your quota is, and double that and say, okay, if my quota is a million dollars or if I have to get 10 or 20 meetings a month or something like that, then I'm gonna take that and I'm gonna get $2 million. So I'm gonna take it and make it 30 meetings a month and see how I back into those numbers and what activities I need to be able to do to hit those targets. And then map out what your activities need to be able to do on a daily basis to be able to hit that. So we'll talk a little bit more about that because there are some questions that came in. Uh, I posted a question out there on social about what you guys wanted me to talk about today. And one of the topics that came up was referrals. So I'm going to hit on that first and then address some of those questions. But <clears throat> the referral thing, um, I'm going to talk about this in context in a couple of different ways. One is asking for referrals from people on like LinkedIn or, or just partners, but then also asking for internal referrals within organizations. And the premise here is I think people are super, obviously referrals is a great way to sell. When, when somebody you know makes a suggestion to somebody else and say, hey, John, you should talk to this person. If that's somebody I, I value their opinion, I will talk to that person and I will have that conversation. And so those are the warmest most open conversations I've had is when somebody else suggests I talk to somebody and, and there's a trust factor there. The problem is, is that most people are super lazy when dealing with or asking for referrals. You know, and I'm going to use LinkedIn as an example here. I was a super early adopter on LinkedIn. I was, you know, I think I was member 10,132. So way early on, I didn't even know what LinkedIn, when it first, what it was when it first came out. I was just, yep, sure. Okay, fine. I'll just accept all this stuff. And so I have well over 10,000 connections on LinkedIn and I get at least, at least five to 10 requests a week from people saying, hey, John, I see you're one connected to so-and-so, whoever that is. Uh, could you make the introduction for me? Now, my answer to that every time, if that's the approach is, hey, I see you're one connected to so-and-so, could you make that introduction? My answer to that is always absolutely not. Or I might not even, I might not even uh, respond to you if it's that generic of an approach, right? Because first of all, the likelihood of me knowing who you're reaching out to on my LinkedIn, I know less than 1% of the people on my LinkedIn profile. I've gotten to the point where I just accept everybody because I'm taking a different approach to most uh, on LinkedIn where I'm trying to get as many people, I'm trying to connect with as many people because I want to, I'm doing the personal brand building pretty heavy because that's my company too. I still recommend other people do it. But before I was doing the Jade Barrows brand, what I would do is I was very selective about network. If you requested a LinkedIn request from me, I, I would reply back and say, look, I'm happy to connect with you. Let me just make sure we set very clear expectations about how I manage my LinkedIn network. If I'm connected to somebody, if I'm one connected to somebody, 
uh, and you look for a recommendation or a, or a referral there, I'll make that connection and I expect the exact same thing from you. So if I see you're one connected from somebody and I want a referral to somebody, I expect you're going to make that if I take the right approach. That's how I used to deal with it because I was a sales rep within a company and my network was pretty tight. Now I've just opened it up to say, all right, I want to connect with everybody. It's a different strategy now based on what I'm doing. But that said, since I've shifted that strategy, again, I know less than 1% of the people that are in my, in my network well enough to, to say, oh yeah, sure. No problem. Go talk to that person. Or for them, that person to recognize a referral from me being like, oh yeah, who's John? Yeah, I know him, but I, you know, I don't really know him. <clears throat> so First of all, the likelihood of me knowing the person you're reaching out to is not high. And the likelihood of me knowing you well enough to put my name on you, I, way lower. I mean, I could have met you five years ago at an event or something like that or trained you five or six years ago. I mean, you could be an axe murderer for all I know. I, there's no way I'm going to put my name on you if you're going to take this generic approach. But if you go on my LinkedIn profile and you say, hey, John, I see you're one connected to Morgan, for instance. Say Morgan and I weren't working together. And I see you one connected to Morgan and man, I've been following him for a while now and I've been noticing his SDR chronicles. And, and, you know, one of the things I wanted to talk to him about is we're working with a lot of other people like Morgan and we're helping them address these challenges. And I was wondering, could you make that introduction for me? So you almost ghost write the email, right? So I can just really just forward it along to Morgan. If you do that, your chances of me making that introduction go up exponentially, right? So, you know, I, I, look, I'm probably not going to put a ton of weight behind it, but I'll say, hey, Morgan, this kid put some effort into it. Um, you know, take a look. Let me know if you're interested. If you are, let me know and, and I'll make that connection. Right. <clears throat> so it goes up exponentially if you put in that type of effort. But I'd say out of the say I get 10 requests a week, maybe maybe one of them is personalized to that person as opposed to just, hey, John, could you make the connection? And this goes also back to just personalization in general. I, this weekend, because I was sitting up in uh, in Burlington, Vermont, with not a lot to do, but sit there and you know watch the set get broken down and set up, and, and there's a lot of downtime. So I did a lot of downtime stuff. And one of the things was I went into all my LinkedIn messages. And I had over 500 messages on LinkedIn. And I feel bad because I don't really, was, I, I don't check my messages all that often on LinkedIn because I get so much spam on there. It's usually people trying to pitch me a product in a generic pitch or, hey, congratulations on your work anniversary. By the way, don't congratulate me on any work anniversaries. It means zero to me that you do that. I, I, I hate to say it, but it's more spam than anything else. So anyways, there was a whole bunch of that crap. <clears throat> and so I just started mowing through every one of them. And you know, only 35 of the 500 plus, I think I forget what the total number is, but only 35 of them were actually personalized where somebody went on and had a real reason they were reaching out to me and wasn't a template. 35, that, it, was, it was, I did the numbers. It was 0.05% of my messages on LinkedIn were customized to me. So guess which ones I responded to? 35 of them. It's the same thing with the referrals, okay? So the more, and I get it, I understand we're trying to do things at scale, but if you are genuinely reaching out to somebody to make an introduction for you to somebody else that you want to get in touch with, you better put in the effort, all right? And that is, so that's LinkedIn. That's kind of the obvious approach. It's same holds true for existing accounts. So say, um, say you're working with a customer and you're doing some really good work with them in a certain division or whatever it is, but you want to go high, wide, and deep, right? You want to get into a different department in a different organism, you know, different part of the org chart, if you will. So let's use the easy ones like sales and marketing. Say I'm training sales and we're, we're crushing it on the sales side of the house and I want to go talk to marketing. Well, unless you have your champion of all champions, right, where you're like, hey, you know, so-and-so, I, uh, I know we're crushing it for you. You mind making the introduction to marketing? I'd really appreciate it. Look, if you, if you have that kind of relationship, then go for it. Most of us don't with our customers. Most of us don't have that, like, hey, you're my boy type of thing. Do me a solid. And even if you do, I still don't think you should take the, hey, do me a solid and, and make that recommendation, right? You still need to put in the effort. So when you are going high, wide, and deep within existing accounts, you can ask for referrals in one of two ways, or you can leverage that relationship in one of two ways. One is you go after the person that you have the relationship with and you ask for the referral. The other is you go after that person that you want to talk to and reference this person. So I'll go through both options. When I'm working with somebody on the sales side of the house and I want to get to somebody on the marketing side of the house, 
I got to go find out what's going on on the marketing side of the house to have a reason to make the introduction. So usually that comes in the form of doing research on them, you know, having, doing some homework, um, you know, uh, looking on their website or, or look at the, looking at the LinkedIn profile of the person that is, that is head of that division. So I can say to my point of contact, hey, Sarah, you know, we've been working together for a while now. <clears throat> and uh, from a sales side of the house, and I really appreciate our relationship here. And use this phrase, as I learn more about your business, I actually noticed some really cool stuff going on on the marketing side of the house. And I was wondering if you could make an introduction to me over there, because a lot of our clients who use this over here on the sales side also leverage us over here on the marketing side. And I'd love to just see if that could be something we could work on together. Could you make that introduction? So again, there's got to be that reason, right? So that's if you, you know, that's the approach I take. If I have a pretty solid relationship with that person and I think they will make the recommendation, but I, again, I have to almost ghostwrite the email about why so they can just forward it over and do no work. The other approach is if this person isn't really, I'm not really tight with them, my main point of contact. I have a decent relationship with them, but they may or may, I don't, you know, they may or may not make the recommendation. Um, then I'll go after the other person and I'll reference this person. So as an example, I'll say something like on the market, say I'm going to say Sarah's on the sales side of the house and Jim's on the marketing side of the house. I'll still, again, go do my research on the marketing side of the house, find out why I want to talk to Jim and why it's different than what I'm talking to Sarah about. And I'll say to Jim, hey, Jim, I've been working with it, uh, Sarah for a while now to address your sales needs in these areas. And man, we've been doing some great stuff together over here. Again, as I learn more about your business, I noticed the stuff that you're doing over here on the marketing side of the house. And I would love to talk to you because a lot of our clients, again, who use us over on the sales side of the house, leverage us on the marketing, and this is why. What's the best way to get some time on your calendar? So that way you've separated the conversation, right? Because if Sarah catches wind that you're trying to expand without really, without leveraging her, but it's, and it's something similar to what she could address, she's probably gonna get pissed off. But if it's totally separate, now it's like, oh, sorry, sir. I didn't realize that you, you know, you, you also manage that stuff as well. That's why I was just trying to expand the audience here because we bring value in different areas. So you might still piss off Sarah, but at least you did it and it was a separate conversation. So the overwhelming point here is to make it easy for the person that you are asking for the re referral from to make that referral by giving, by having a reason why you want to talk to this person and, and almost writing it out in that email and then asking them to pretty much forward it over to you. And then the last piece on referrals I'll, I'll mention is when we're dealing with partners, All right? We do, with, I used to do with a lot of partners and we'd always have this, this, you know, we grab lunch or something or breakfast or, you know, to a new partner and say, oh yeah, let's definitely share some leads, you know, like, why don't you go back to your office and I'll go back to mine and, uh, and I'll look to see if there's anybody that fits your profile and I'll make some recommendations and you can do the same. We'll start there and then we'll see where it goes. And then it would never you know, nobody would ever go back to their office and just hand out two or three people for them to talk to. So what I used to do is I would just, again, it would make it very easy for people to make referrals for me. And this goes to customers as well, by the way, if you're looking for external referrals to like other customers that fit their profile, first of all, two things you have to do. One is you have to identify and do a one pager on the exact ideal customer profile of the type of clients you're looking for, all right? size, industries, scenario, whatever it is, as tight as you can get it. Like, look, these are the type of clients. And I recommend focusing on your tier one ideal customer profile. Then come up with a list of, I used to call my hit list, right? Where these are the, these are like the 25 and these are the 50 logos I absolutely want to get into because I've done that profiling exercise and I know these are the ones. So for instance, I used to carry that list around with me in, a, in, a, in my back pocket as it printed out every time I had a, a conversation with somebody. And so when the conversation came up of, hey, why don't we make some referrals for each other? What I would do would be like, great, you know what? Here, instead of just going back to the office and I would open up that list and be like, do you know anybody on this list? Because these are the exact accounts that I definitely want to get into. And they'd say, oh yeah, absolutely. I know that. Okay, could you make those introductions for me? And by the way, before you do, let me go back to my office and let me go kind of see where I stand with each one of them as far as who I'm talking to and those type of things. And I'll send you an email on each one of those about the reason I want to reach out to them. And then you can just forward that along. Would you do me that favor? Yeah, absolutely, John, no problem. So, or if, if they didn't know anybody on that list, 
then I would say, okay, well, here's kind of my, my really specific ideal customer profile here. Uh, if you could find somebody within your territory or within your region or within your customer base that fits that profile, those are the referrals that I want. So again, you've got to make it easy for people because if you don't, they'll never do it. Um, and and that goes for existing accounts, that goes for new accounts, um, that goes for you know LinkedIn, that goes for any any other way. You have to do the work to get to earn the referral, okay? And just don't be lazy with it. And also with the LinkedIn stuff, if you really genuinely want to connect with somebody on LinkedIn, just uh, personalize it because it just uh, you know, especially when you're reaching out to influencers, influencers and stuff like that, like. I can't tell you, I, there's people out there that have way more connections than I do. And, you know, Keenan's one of these, like he actually did a LinkedIn post of all the different messages that he had in LinkedIn and how none of them were personalized. And it really does just kind of like, yeah, all right, okay, fine. You go into this bucket. But if the people that want to leverage and network and, and really get the most out of these relationships, they put some effort, they add value, they have reasons. Those are the ones that I pay attention to. And those are the ones that the executives pay attention to as well. All right. So I'm going to kind of stop on that one and, and, and open it up to Q&A right now. Um, and again, we had some questions that came in before this, but if you have any questions right now that you want to jump in on, uh, by all means, um, hit me up, right? Just fire it right into the, the chat form here in, in Facebook. Uh, but some of the questions, actually, Richard, a uh, good friend of mine, Richard Harris, how you doing, Richard? I don't know if you're watching, but um, he asked, what should reps be doing now to finish the year off successfully and prep for next year? And that kind of goes to what I was saying prior to, you know, when I, when I kick things off here, which is, first of all, right now, go take a look at the blog post that I wrote last week on what you should be doing right now to figure out which deals in your pipeline are actually going to close. It is December 12th, December 11th right now. If you don't know your deal is going to close by like, if you don't have like a signed date where the client says, yes, we will sign on this date and you have a meeting on their calendar and you're just kind of, and you haven't talked to them in a week or so, uh, the likelihood of it happening is not high. But what I would do is for clients that I hadn't talked to in a little while and I'm getting nervous about, I don't want to call just to touch base and check in and see where we are on the contract, right? That's kind of annoying. What I would do is do what my favorite nugget is, which is send them my summary email. If you haven't done this already, again, you can type in Jay Barrow's uh, favorite nugget and you'll find out what this is. Usually what I do is use this after every meeting that I have with somebody to, to document our conversation and hold them accountable for it. But if I haven't done it up until this point and I'm waiting and I'm kind of sweating to see if they're going to close or not by the end of the year, I'm still going to leverage the same approach. So what I'll do is I'll reach out to my main point of contact of the client that I thought, you know, that I think is going to close by the end of the year and say, hey, you know what? I've been thinking a lot about our opportunity that we've been working on together here. I'm really excited about moving forward with you. I just wanted to make sure that we were still on the same page with everything. Could you do me a favor and review this just to let me know if it's all accurate and, and if I missed anything here? And then just bullet out kind of the core stuff. Like your current situation is this, your timeline is this, your priorities are this. And I mean that from a business standpoint, but also from a, a decision-making process standpoint, right? So from a business moving into 2018, you're going to be, you know, focusing on X, Y, Z, and this is what you're trying to accomplish. And then, but from this decision, your, your priorities when making this decision are one, two, and three, well, and, and rank them. Like this is the most important and this is, you know, everything else. And then your timeline and whatever, and, and, and these are the next steps and see if they respond back. If they respond back, you know, with hopefully some confirmation and stuff like that, then you're obviously, I think, in pretty good shape. If they don't respond back to that email, and again, this is factual stuff. Do not spin this from a sales standpoint. Don't say, oh, and we're the best solution you've ever seen in your life or whatever. Purely to confirm what you heard from them, right? If they don't respond to that, I'd be real worried about that deal closing by the end of the year here, okay? So focus on the, <clears throat> focus on the deals that you know you can close and don't focus on the deals that... that are, are you're saying there's a chance you know those 20 percenters that you're just hoping on and you're going to beat them up and, and don't just i don't know I'm, i i get it i understand what's going to happen at the end of the year here with discounting but do your best not to use the discount close the discount close is one of the saddest closes out there when you've done all this work you've earned the right to close them you know you're the best solution and now you're sweating it because the end of the year is coming and you're not going to hit your target so you proactively call up a client and who will close, who probably close in January, right? But you call them up and you're like, hey, you know what? If you close in December 30, by December 31st, I'll give you a 20% off or 10% off. 
that's just, I really recommend against that unless it's an absolute necessity to hit your, to hit your number. Um, because first of all, it really diminishes your value. Forget about the diminishes the price and, and discounting. Discounting diminishes your value and the value that the client sees in the product. Because if you positioned it at this level, as far as value is concerned, and then you, you know, all of a sudden discount it by 20%, now they're looking at like, well, wait a minute, like how much profit was in there for you guys? Are you just making up your prices? So now I devalued your whole solution and you might lose the deal because of it, by the way. And the other problem with discounting is you give up that, you say, hey, I'll close, you know, if you close by the end of the year, um, I'll give you this discount. And they say yes, and then they don't, well, now you're the asshole either way, right? Because now January, first of all, you're probably bugging the crap out of them all the way up until the end of the year. And then January hits and they're like, yeah, sorry, I couldn't get to it. Our year end was crazy. Uh, you still want to move forward here. Can I get that discount? Now you got to be the jerk either way, right? You either have to tell them, no, sorry. And everybody knows the discount doesn't go away. I mean, the, your profitability doesn't change between December 31st and January 1st. So everybody knows the discount's still there. Um, and, and the other thing, or the other thing you got to do is you got to be a jerk and go back to your manager and say, hey, boss, uh, can, I, can I extend that discount? Now you're going to be the jerk either way. So do everything you can not to, to use the discount close because it really diminishes everything that we do in sales. Um, but I, again, I get it. We're going to have to use it. Um, I would recommend if you do give away a discount, get something in return. And I don't just mean the signed contract, get something like a, a testimonial or a case study or a multi-year contract. You know what I mean? Say, okay, look, I could probably knock 20% off if you sign up for a two-year contract, if you sign up for a three-year contract or something like that, or instead of 20 licenses, you buy 30 licenses. So at least get, have some teeth to it. Uh, so it's more than just, you're just giving away a discount. Uh, and you've heard me talk about this before, but I'll throw it in again. Please, moving into 2018, get the word discount out of your vocabulary and change it to the words flexibility and creativity, all right? Look, I'm, I'm happy to get flexible with my pricing. I, I can totally get creative here, but get the word discounting out of your vocabulary, all right? Because flexibility and creativity is a different conversation than discount. Discount's a dollar or a percentage off of the price. Creativity is, hey, let's talk about some additional things we might be able to add here, multiple level contracts, you know, different departments involved. Uh, flexibility entails the same thing. So try to shift that conversation. So that's where, to Richard, to your question, you know, right now, focus on the deals that you can close. Summarize it if you don't already know. Get firm commit dates, not just, yeah, they're going to sign by the end of the month, but when. I, I put yes, no meetings on people's calendars. When they say, yeah, John, we're going to make a decision on Friday. Great, great. When do you want to talk on Friday? So, and I'll say this, when do you want to talk on Friday? So I can get a yes or a no from you either way. And they'll say, you know, a Friday afternoon is good. What time on Friday afternoon? You know what? And, and again, say this, you know what? Do you have your calendar in front of you? And then shh and wait for it. There'll be that little awkward pause when I realize that you got them and say, look, why don't we just throw some on the calendar here? If we need to reschedule, we can. Uh, but this way I can get a yes or no from you either way, and we don't have to play chase. And by the way, I say that one too. So we don't have to play chase. Letting you know we're going to play chase, and I'm better at it than you are, all right? Right? That's my job for crying out loud. So I'm going to eventually get through, and it's going to be weird eventually, right, when I do get through. So let's just throw it on the calendar so I can get a yes or no from you either way. Letting you know it's totally okay to tell me no. All right. Yes is the best answer in sales. No is the second best answer in sales. Maybe your no response is the absolute worst. All right. So you do those things to clean up your pipeline and focus. Um, then end of the year, force time to reflect on the previous year, on how you did, on your goals and, and what went well, what didn't go well. And I would actually recommend um, doing this where you sit down with a friend who knows you, maybe a colleague, like one of your one of your peers, not your manager. Because your manager is going to have a certain lens, but maybe somebody that you're, you're friends with at the office and go out and grab lunch or something and say, hey, look, could you give me some, some honest feedback about where you see my strengths and weaknesses and, and be totally open to that feedback uh, from, a, from a genuine standpoint of, hey, this is where I think you really do well. This is where some challenges I see from you. Um, I do that with my, my colleague and peer, Chris Merrill, uh, all the time. He's uh, who helped, who started my first company, Thrive Networks. He's the one who I partner with at Playground Partners. 
And, and we have this, you know, at the end of the year, it's just like, all right, personally, life goals, personal goals, professional goals, feedback for each other about what we see as good and bad about, you know, challenges and opportunities for each one of us. And it's just kind of that, that level set from somebody you trust. And again, not your manager or not somebody who doesn't know you, but somebody who knows you to sit down and do that self-reflection, if you will. And then plan out next year. All right. So look at, OK, what's going on next year and what do I need to be do to be successful next year? And I don't just mean like, yeah, your quota is a part of that. But also at the end of next year, if you sit down at the end of next year, looking back, would you say, well, what would what would determine success for this year? Was it just a quota thing? OK. Or is it that I made a certain amount of money because I was able to achieve this certain thing and I was able to buy that or I was able to take this vacation or whatever it is? Put that out there. And, and then back into the numbers, I usually set life goals, right? Where, where do I want to be in my, perf- in, in my personal lifestyle? You know, for me, you've heard me talk about this before, where it's all about, for me, it's not necessarily about revenue anymore. It's about time and time back with my family and how much time do I want to give, you know, last year, what I did was I blocked off Mondays and Fridays for, so that I wouldn't travel. Oh, I'm sorry. I wouldn't train on Mondays and Fridays in the last week of the year. I'm sorry, the last week of the month. That was what I set last year as goals. Is so, you know, I travel on Mondays and Fridays, but I wouldn't train on Mondays and Fridays because I, you know, leaving on a weekend and coming home on a weekend, that's tough for the seven-year-old daughter. Same thing with last week of the month. Last week of the month, I tried to lock in and said, look, I won't travel. I'll train locally here, but I won't travel. So I set those aside. Um, and I even said stuff like, I want to take my daughter to school at least five times a month. I want to, I want to be the one that drives and drops her off at school at least five times a month. Um, you know, personal, as far as work out a certain amount of time, that one I'm horrible at. But those type of things, you set down, like, what are your personal goals? And then you figure out, okay, well, how much money do I need to make to be able to hit that? And then what are my activities I need to be able to do to make the money to live the lifestyle that I want to live? And, the, and you've seen this before. I'll probably be posted again, which is know your equation going into 2018. Take your revenue target, figure out what that needs to be based on the lifestyle you want to live and what you need to do with your organization. And again, I recommend doubling it uh, so you can back into the numbers there and then figure out what's your average deal size. And then what are your conversion ratios through the various stages of the sales process? And so you can come down to, okay, on a weekly basis, this is what I need to do. I need to be doing this many activities every single week to be able to hit my targets, all right? That's the activity level. And then you can kind of figure out along the way where to tweak the dials as far as how to increase or decrease the the conversion ratios at each one of those stages. Um, And then uh, the last thing I'll make on that point is just make sure you're prospecting right now. Don't just focus on closing right now, right? Because if you close everything in your pipeline and you start January, I mean, you start January 1 with an empty pipeline, this is a very unforgiving profession, all right? Because if you close everything out, you could crush your year, 2017 here, crush your quarter in the fourth quarter right now. But if you have nothing going into Q1 next year and you lay an egg in Q1, you're, good, you're as good as fire in most organizations. No matter how good this year was, sales is a what have you done for me lately profession. And if you don't have consistency in your pipeline, that's why for you AEs, senior AEs out there, don't just rely on marketing and SDRs and BDRs to fill up that pipeline. Look at that as icing on the cake. Own your target, own your quota. Don't let anybody else uh, dictate whether you succeed or fail on that, all right? And for you SDRs and BDRs out there, you know, crush your quota and, and, and really fo- focus on the quality of the leads that you're giving over um, so that you can, you know, uh, again, hand over stuff and be promoted a lot faster because you're doing the right jobs and you're working with your AEs the best way, okay? Uh, I'll do one more question here. Uh, Christian uh, Sharkey, this one ties into inside sales uh, events a bit. How to improve demos, best practices, and common mistakes. Um, actually, this is probably a much longer conversation than, that, than I have here in the next two minutes, but I will try to address it in one main uh, thing to think about, which is context over content. You've heard me talk about this before. Gary V is the one who got me on this. He says, you know, everybody talks about content is king, content is king. He says, fine. If content is king, then context is God. And that to me is marketing versus sales. 
Marketing is context, sales is content. If we as sales professionals are not putting any context around our content, we are no different than marketing and therefore I have no idea why we're getting paid to do what we do. So for instance, um, uh, Christian, on your, um, on your demos, content is you growing through every single slide and so i'm going to put a 30 minute demo here that i'd like to go through with you and if you have any questions just let me know okay right um and then pause and intermittently so does that make sense does that make sense context is hey you know what? we're going to spend the first five to ten minutes here really reviewing or understanding what your priorities are and what you want to get out of this and then i'm going to take that 30 minutes or those 30 slides and cut them down to the probably the 10 or 15 that are most relevant to you and then as you go through the presentation, you highlight the parts based on their priorities and ask for their feedback. So instead of saying, does that make sense? You say stuff like, could you give me an example of how you see that fitting into your existing workflow? Or could you give, you, could you give me an example of how that compares to what you're doing now? That right there is how you, you, you have a conversation with people. You don't pitch them on anything. You have that slide deck and you, you kind of highlight the ones that are most relevant. It's the same thing with, um, you know, with presentations and demos and those type of things. People want to be talked with, not to, all right? That's the biggest piece of advice I can give you. Now, there's a few other questions here that we'll go into and I'll answer them on, on Facebook. Um, the one final thing I will ask is this, I'm gonna do another Make It Happen Monday next week. So, you know, hit me up with questions. I'm, <laughs> I need a favor though. I, I rarely ask for this. I try to give away as much free content as I possibly can. I need a favor from everybody who's following me on this, on the podcast and on Facebook Live here. Uh, there's um, there's a sales development summit that's going on right now. And there's a, a, a poll to see who is the 2017 sales development thought leader of the year. Uh, I'm on that list. There's a bunch of great people on that list. I, I, I hesitate to say this because I don't like dogging anybody, but there's somebody on here who I, I fundamentally believe, I, I, I just take a different approach to, and I, I really don't want to lose to. And it's Grant Cardone. And look, I know there's a lot of people who out there who love Grant Cardone. Uh, he's got a much bigger following than me. Um, he's, 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 but he's the typical Glengarry Glenn Ross, Wolf of Wall Street, Boiler Room type of sales rep that I personally just do not think it has a place in B2B sales. B2C sales, fine, maybe. But in B2B sales, it's about authenticity. It's about, um, it's about empathy. It's about caring. And it's not about a slick thing to say to somebody to get them to to close so i am i'm asking my audience here to go to https slash back back you know, whack whack sales development summit.com slash voting and vote for me or anybody else on that list like i got some great friends on this list who are incredible chad craig obviously morgan's going to be on there and my two favorite women in the entire actually three favorite women in the world uh, in, in the world of sales, Trish Bertuzzi, Lori, and Jill Conrath. Um, please vote for any of them. Uh, uh, right now, Grant's at 321 votes. I'm at I'm the closest one with 307. I would love your help uh, pushing me over the edge here. It's it's about what there's one day and 22 hours left on this one, and I would greatly appreciate it if you get any value out of what I put out there, and you think that I'm uh, uh, you know even worthy of that vote. I would greatly appreciate it. All right. And I'll do everything I can to keep flooding the market with good, solid content that makes a difference. Um, and, and in my opinion, does sales the right way. Because I always say this, when sales done right, it's the greatest profession in the world. When done wrong, it's the worst. Let's do it right. And let's do it right together. All right? Make it a great week this week, everybody. Crush your quota. Do everything you can to close out your pipeline strong and prepare for next year. And if there's anything that I can do to help you do that, do not hesitate to hit me up on Facebook, on Twitter, on Snapchat, or any of those. My handle on all of it is John Amazon Michael Barrows, all one word. And I will answer any question that you have whenever you have it. All right. Make it a great week, everybody. Let's make it happen. Thanks.